Press, could you please raise your hand? Thank you. So we are going to move forward. Thank you, Francisco. Good morning and welcome. I'm Abdul Khan. I lead the water budget and analytics section in DWR's division of planning. Two of my team members, uh, Todd Hillier and Paul Shipman and I uh, planned to talk about the draft water budget handbook that was released on February 7. Unfortunately, uh, Paul could not be with us today, so Todd and I will cover for him. Our presentation is divided into four segments. I'll cover segments one and four, and Todd will cover segments two and three. Later, uh, Stephen Springhorn will discuss considerations in light of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. This slide shows uh, how to use uh, okay. So we took that yeah. All right, this slide shows a conceptual representation uh, of water budget for an area. Uh, water budget for an area is important uh, because it provides an understanding of historical conditions and how future changes to supply, demand, hydrology, population, land use, and climate may affect the water resources of the area. Water budgets are also important because water agencies use water budgets for a variety of purposes, such as water supply planning and evaluating the effectiveness of management actions to ensure long-term sustainability of surface water and groundwater resources in the area. Recognizing the importance of water budgets, several recent legislation, including the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, and Assembly Bill 1668 have codified water budget development to be part of groundwater sustainability plans and agricultural water management plans. Recently released Governor's draft water resilience portfolio has actions recommending the development of water budgets as an integral component of planning to advance water resilience in California. The Water Budget Handbook is the outcome of two water budget pilot projects conducted by the Department of Water Resources in Tularele and Central Coast Hydrologic Regions. Take home lessons from the pilot projects and from interactions with local agencies a recognition of several factors that are hindering the development of water budgets in the state. A critical challenge is use of inconsistent definitions of water budget components. The same term could be used to define different components while different terms are used to mean the same water budget components. A second major challenge is use of non-standard water accounting, which makes it difficult to understand and communicate water budget information in a consistent manner. Another challenge is poor documentation, which prevents creation of a knowledge base for use by other water resources practitioners and building technical capacity within an organization for water budget development. To address the various challenges identified, DWR developed the Water Budget Handbook as a practical reference guide for the California water resources community for developing water budgets for any geographic area and time period using modeling and non-modeling approaches. The handbook fills a significant gap by systematically presenting relevant information in a single publication. This effort benefited greatly from collaboration with an extensive review from multiple DWR programs and other entities, including the USGS, 
the State Water Board, and academia. The handbook includes the concept of total water budget, common vocabulary, water budget accounting template, decision tree for selecting an approach, water budget, and guidance on documenting water budgets. We believe use of the handbook will facilitate consistent development and communication of water budget information by diverse water management entities. We also believe that the handbook will reduce the cost of water budget development and documentation for local and regional agencies. The handbook contains nine sections. Sections one and two of the handbook cover foundational concepts related to water budget development. I will cover uh, some of these foundational concepts in the next few slides. The handbook includes the first ever three-dimensional representation of water budget components using a systems approach. The, what, the total water budget is a comprehensive accounting of all flows, inflows, and outflows from three interacting systems in a water budget zone. The land system, uh, the surface water system and the groundwater systems and as shown in on this slide uh, and also in the slide we show the water budget zone which represents any user-defined water management area such as a watershed a groundwater basin or a water district on the schematic flows entering the water budget zone are shown as blue arrows Flows leaving the water budget zone are shown as orange arrows. Flows from one system to another are shown as green arrows. And internal flows within a system are shown as purple arrows. Depending on the particular need of an agency and importance of individual water budget components for an area, a few, some, or all components shown on this diagram will need to be accounted uh, for in a water budget. For example, an area which does not have any groundwater component, water budget for that area may focus only on the land and surface water system, the blue uh, system shown on the uh, diagram and the green system shown on the diagram will need to be considered. The handbook includes also the first ever common vocabulary for each component of the total water budget. Uh, this common vocabulary was vetted again with multiple DWR programs, the State Water Board, USGS, and academia to facilitate consistent understanding and communication of water budgets. This slide shows an example common vocabulary, uh, groundwater export, which is defined as volume of groundwater pumped from the underlying aquifer for use outside the water budget zone. A standardized water budget accounting template is also included in the handbook to help organize and present inflows and outflows for the land system, the surface water system, and the groundwater system as well as the total water budget. Total water budget in this context is the aggregation of water budgets of the three interacting systems. This accounting template, we believe, will facilitate standardization, error checking, and correction of water budget development and estimates. Use of a standardized template, we believe, will also result in improved communication and coordination with neighboring water agencies through consistent water budget accounting across boundaries and water budget zones. Two general approaches to water budget development are discussed in the handbook, modeling approach and non-modeling approach. The modeling approach is the most comprehensive way of developing a total water budget for a water budget zone. 
but development of a defensible integrated numerical model that is well calibrated and has stakeholders buy-in requires considerable in investment in data, tools, people, and process. On the other hand, the non-modeling approach is used in the absence of a robust, accepted integrated numerical model or when a model may not be needed for estimating the required water budget components. The water budget handbook is intended to assist water managers having different levels of data, capacities, and resources. It includes several decision trees to select an approach to water budget development. This slide shows the logical steps for determining when to use a non-modeling approach and when to use a modeling approach. There may be cases when a hybrid approach of both modeling and non-modeling may be best suited for an area depending on data availability and existing model features. Appropriate and sufficient documentation of the water budget is essential for stakeholders, neighboring jurisdiction, jurisdictions, and regulators to understand the basis of the developed water budget. Documentation can also serve as a knowledge base for a water agency, as well as facilitating staff development and succession planning. Documentation of water budgets is important for both modeling and non-modeling approaches. This completes uh, segment one of the presentation. Thank you, everyone. And I'll now hand over to Todd to cover segments two and three of the presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Todd Hilaire. I work with the Department of Water Resources Northern Region Office. And in helping to put together this uh, handbook, I just wanted to kind of highlight the fact that I've been working on water budgets for the better part of 30 years and wanted to convey that the things that I've learned over all those years, we really focused on trying to incorporate into this handbook to provide a really useful tool and guidance in going, how do I calculate any any water budget term or term in your component in this in this document within this framework. So that's kind of my approach in, in, in working on this effort to help you all be able to do th this work and provide some good information to you. So I'm gonna start off, I'm gonna be kind of going through six sections, but I'm gonna start off with uh, the first three, which will be sections three, four, and five. And what you're seeing here on the screen is really from our table of contents, these are the section three is the land system, section four is the surface water system, and section five is the groundwater se section. Systems really are a key to approach to developing the wa total water budget. We help to break down uh, the water budget into kind of bite-sized pieces. We can look at each of the systems and all the interactions. So here you see under each section is a lot of the water or water components water budget components. And so uh, each one you can see there's a number of them. Uh, where we can, we've actually have subsections that have multiple, several water budget components combined together where multiple water budget components might use similar techniques. We put them together to hopefully create some utility and uh, help focus on uh, efficiently going through this. One of the things you'll see with the way we laid this out is if you actually follow this from three section three, four, and five, you could just walk through this and put together a water budget. It takes you kind of through a sequential pattern of, I want to start from scratch and put one together, you can follow this. If you are already experienced but want to go look at, how do I just compute this one water budget? You can go right into that water budget and uh, uh, look at how the different methods we have to calculate it. So focusing on section three, if you remember Abdul described or showed the overall total water budget schematic. 
in each of the sections, we've act, extracted out um, a schematic from that uh, total water budget to help the user focus on the components that are related to, in this case, this is the land system. So you can see you know, all the interactions of components with it. What I'd like to kind of note is we do account for changes in storage, which you can see the root zone storage, the unsaturated zone storage, and the change in the land system storage. And but within the land system, we identify both native land uses and managed land uses. So the idea here with the total water budget, we are doing a mass balance. We're going to account for everything. So both native and managed land uses are presented here. But when we do a water budget for managed land, use, managed land uses, we want to dive into the details because a water budget is supposed to tell us something about how water management is occurring in any one area, in this case, a water budget zone. So to provide more utility, we've broken things down by agricultural lands, managed wetlands, and urban areas, as you see in the schematics presented on the, on the screen. For example, the agricultural lands, applied water is a basically a supply, supply, and then you can see the components and interactions of the disposition of that supply. Managed wetlands is similar to ag, except for it has generally ponded water in its management. When you look at the urban area diagram or schematic, you can see we're getting into a comprehensive accounting of flows. We're trying to think ahead and incorporate all those things that affect water management. We look at a per urban applied water. You can see landscape is addressed, indoor water use, you know, wastewater going to collection facilities where stormwater collection could be picked up and used. The disposition of those flows into recycle water, manage aquifer recharge. We're characterizing a complete water budget. You don't actually have to use every single term but it's there for your use and for your ability to communicate with your stakeholders really pertinent information. To help understand what, you know, kind of applied water or what we call also supply and disposition of that supply, we've put together a couple bar charts uh, under the categories of agricultural lands and urban lands. Looking at the urban lands on the left side, of the screen, you can see we have supplies. We address precipitation coming in as a supply and applied water as a supply. You can see surface water, groundwater, stormwater extraction, uh, reuse, recycle water help to make up applied water component of supply. And then you can see where the disposition of that is going into evapotranspiration. You can look at recharge of applied water, return flow of applied water. And the idea is to get a, this, this diagram and some of our efforts in this workbook is to help characterize and help create an understanding of these water budget components and where all this water goes to and the, and the need to calculate all these particular components. So this next slide, I'm just going to give you kind of a oh, high, high level view of what's in each of the sections, subsections that uh, can be used to uh, look at water budget components. This example is the uh, component uh, evapotranspiration in section 3.4. So you see that listed on the, sh the page on the very left side of the screen. In each section, we remind, we pre present the definition we try to provide some, co provide some context around what does evaporation mean, evapotranspiration mean, and what can be included in evapotranspiration. Then in kind of in the center, the uh, left center page, we present how you determine ET. And that leads to the right center page you see highlighted are the methods that we present. And this is kind of typical of each of the sections uh, water budget component sections in the document. And then this slide I'm kind of highlighting just so you can see those, those methods. For just determining evapotranspiration, you have four methods. You can obtain estimates from available reports, obtain estimates from models, 
uh, gain estimate, use crop coefficient approach, or use a water duty based approach to calculate ET. Then moving in this, in this slide, we're looking at method three for calculating applied water. And I'm going to kind of walk you through several pages, kind of the thought process and how what we presented in this particular section is kind of a, an example. So we start off with, uh, we're looking at method three, estimate applied water volumes. And you can see the arrow going from, we're going to use the crop ET based approach. You can see the arrow going down to the highlighted page in the middle going, there's a discussion on using this particular approach. And then there's uh, arrows that point to the very right side of the page that present equations on how you would how you would calculate it based on this approach. And you can see the bottom highlighted equation is applied water is equal to you know acreage times unit ETAW. That's like on farm ET uh, per acre. Uh, you divide that by irrigation efficiency, so that's important to know that. We, we have to know something about cultural practices, so we add that. And if we do that by crop, individual crop, and sum it up, you'll get a pretty good handle on your applied water within your water budget zone. So we kind of lead the user through that. These set of pages kind of just show more of the details that we present. and how we walk the user through. So what you get is the ability to, on the looking at the left, very left side of your screen, you can see a series of steps. Step one to six are highlighted. And we start walking through calculate crop ET requirements, calculate precipitation volume, calculate runoff volume, calculate ET of precipitation, calculate ET of applied water, and then estimate applied water using irrigation efficiency. These are these are steps that build upon each other to help the user get to this calculation and and get to a, an applied uh, applied water volume. Some of the added value of what we have in this document is this this particular component. And there are some other components that are not just an isolated component. They can build off each other. And then in this case. Applied water, you can make estimates of other components. In this case, in the looking in the center of the page, you see steps seven, eight, and nine. Well, you can use applied water if you know something about land use and mapping and water sources by acreage. You could actually end up calculating groundwater extraction, applied water reuse, and surface water supply from those estimates. You can at least get an initial estimate to start your water budget. And then if you follow the arrow over to the right side of the page, we provide an example calculation table of what we what we did to make some estimates of surface and groundwater extractions from some very basic data. This next uh, set of pages continues to highlight that theme of being able to uh, make some estimations of multiple components. On the very right, we have a, a couple of additional examples of computing applied surface water and applied groundwater. Uh, there in tables 3, 2, and 3, 3. In the middle, uh, we have a couple tables that relate irrigation efficiency to um, components of recharge and runoff in the whole irrigation process. And I'll hi highlight that a, bit, a little bit in a few minutes. And then on the right side, again, we can, steps 10 and 11 that are shown that are highlighted lead us into being able to calculate irrigation recharge and irrigation return flow. So we're helping to provide a lot of information to help make estimates of these components with different te techniques or methods. I'm gonna walk through a short example with you on uh, that we provide in the handbook. This is a case example of where just said there's a thousand acres of corn. And you can see the diagram down to the right hand corner where we've taken the water budget schematic 
for agriculture and highlighting the applied water component and the return flow, applied water reuse, and the, the recharge of applied water. We're going to make estimates of those. Well, if we have some basic characteristics or information that we know, such as in this case, we know ET of applied water, in this case it's 2.2 acre feet as an example, we can use the table that I previously mentioned as a guide uh, knowing something about the irrigation method, in this case was furrows and siphon tubes. We can look that up on the table, pull out what are reasonable estimates of recharge and return flow using those type of estimates to start to get into the right ballpark of what do we think is, where do we think all the water is going? So this example helps you to kind of walk through that. This next page just highlights again section, the, there's tables three, four, I've got highlighted, uh, provides information on types of irrigation systems, their, uh, how water, the efficiency of how water is distributed in terms of, you know, uh, you get water going to air evap, soil evap, uh, canopy evaporation, but what, what's important is what's recharged, surface runoff, and then looking at overall efficiency. So these are some tools provided here to help make these calculations. And again, this is, becomes a starting place for, for you. And then finally, we walk through the example and I'm not going to go through all the detailed calcs here, but just to give you a general impression, you can follow through this, and then you can see where I've got highlighted with the red text and the, the yellow calculations. We've got applied water reuse, return flow, and recharge of applied water is calculated. So that will provide you a guide. I want to move on now to section four, and this is the surface water system. You see lakes, streams, diversions, this kind of focuses in in a little different way of all these components that you, uh, the user would look at and need to compute. One of the things that we attempt to really focus on in the, the, the handbook is a complete balance, calculating inflows, outflows, and change in storage. And that we do have also the part of the water budget accounting template. So. In this case, change in storage for surface water is fairly straightforward. It's change, usually changing uh, reservoir storage. You can calculate changes in stream storage. It's a little more difficult and basically and it depend on your time step. But if you can calculate all these independently, if you took inflow minus outflow minus change in storage, in theory it should be zero. Usually it's not, and that's what we call our mass balance error, and that's what's highlighted here is we do determine that through the water budget accounting template and our information in the report and that helps you identify how good your how good your balance is or maybe where you need to go back and take a look at it section five focuses on groundwater we just have the groundwater zone here and you can look at all the interaction of flows you can see things that we've included is water release Water release caused by subsidence is included in here. You can see the subsurface inflow and outflow. So I'm going to go over a few of these com components. Uh, one of the things we really focus on is going over common vocabulary. Uh, we call this term recharge of applied water and precipitation. Documentation shows eh, it ranges from depercolation, percolation, and other terminology to define what the water is that goes down into ground the groundwater. We've chose to use a systematic representation as recharge. In this case, this is recharge of applied water and precipitation. You notice section 5.2 on the left hand page, you know, that's that's the component, but overall component, but in the middle sheet you can see you know, we're estimate, we have provide the ability to estimate both applied water and uh, estimate applied water and precipitation separately because they're separate techniques. So we do provide that guidance in the document, and you can see by the headings at the top, the highlighted areas at the top of the two pages that we go provide you those details. And then we also to help support you know the uh, tracking of 
manage aqua for recharge, we've included uh, several components to do that. Uh, one of them is manage aqua for recharge. We know it's currently going on. We know that it's probably going to be more emphasized and more of it will be going on in the future. We provide that component here for water managers to use. Typically, when we put the water into the ground, there may be some need to track that. And I think that ability is going to grow as, people, as you know, we really focus on a lot of the management of our supplies. So we want to include uh, a couple additional components in addition to just saying groundwater extraction and groundwater export. That managed water that's pulled out of like a water bank, we want to be able to call it uh, stored water extraction. Give it a separate term. If it's accounted for, you can put the numbers in there. Sometimes that stored water extraction, stored water extraction is moved out of a water budget zone. Give the capacity to be able to quantify that and represent it in a total water budget schematic. Um, also included in the handbook, we have um, uh, changing groundwater storage methods. So you can calculate this directly. Again, this helps with calculating all the components of the water budget calculate them all independently, and look at the mass balance area to see how well your water budget is represented. So now I'm going to move on to section six, seven, and eight. These are kind of, these are called our case studies. And so section six is kind of our non-modeling approach case study where we're going to develop a water budget using the components listed here, the methods listed here in the handbook. So, Seven and eight are going to provide guidance on how you how you extract water budget components out of existing models. So we want to give those both options to the user. So in section six, what we do is we take an example region and we'll we provide some maps and description of the area, what's included in the area, so the user can kind of see, okay, here's what's the basis for deriving the water budget. And we list some of the figures and tables, as you can see in the screenshots here on the screen. So what we did is we, we used the non-modeling approach. We computed all the whole, the whole water, total water budget using non-modeling methods, the component approaches listed in sections three, four, and five. And when we made those calculations, we uh, put that into a, the water budget accounting template which is on the left side of the page. And you can see, oh, yes. And we've added a few more categories to cover um, what we wanted to cover. The accounting template allows you flexibility to add uh, more details. It's just a good starting place. You can see we have it on a monthly basis and adding up to an annual. So it's flexible on your time scale. But to the right, along with all this work, what a lot of people want to see is what in the world did you do to get there? And you can look at, we went component by component. We listed, you know, we have a reference to the row in the accounting template, the component, and what techniques, what methods did we use to uh, make those calculations so the user can see, oh, okay, here's how it, how it really applies. And I can, I can do this myself too. And then we provide a reference to the handbook. So that's kind of the guidance and usefulness that we're providing with this, this tool. In section seven, you know, we're really looking at going, somebody's got a, a model, in this case, the integrated water flow model, and I'm wanting to pull the information out and share it with stakeholders and put it into the water budget accounting template. And this is, this section provides opportunities of where to find and pull all that information out and put it into the water budget accounting template. And the temp, water budget accounting template you see on the right side of the page has in there references to where you would pull some of this information out as so that you can use this as a, a way to present information. Uh, similarly, when we look at section eight, we, we provide the same thing for the mod flow ohm, the one water hydrologic model. And so the same guidance is where can you go in and find this information in the model and put it into the water budget accounting template. And sometimes with looking at the models, the models will have a, just a tremendous wealth of information that you may want to refine a, a component or add a component or breakdown. Well, you can pull the model data out and then you can do some further breakdowns if you're filling in the, 
in the water budget accounting template. So that's kind of the flexibility and usefulness that we're trying to provide the user with this, this tool. I'm going to move on to section nine. And this is our data resources directory. Uh, I remember in the early days of putting together water budget, it's like, where do you find information? You used to have to make a lot of phone calls and talk to people and find information and data and resources to make calculations and going, well, we'd like to take from what we learned over the years and start with a directory that kind of says, here's all the data we're aware of and know that can go feed into water the water budgets and hoping that this will be a useful guide, a useful starting place. It's not the end all, but it's a really, a, we believe is a good starting place. And you can see I've highlighted on the pages, you know, on the left side, number nine, section nine, the data resources directory. And you can see there's about 60 different um, data resources that we list out here. Our goal is this is a snapshot in time at the moment. Sometime in the future, we maybe envision this as being a living, a living document where more information is provided and shared and becomes kind of a real up-to-date resource to users in the uh, developing water budgets here, here in California and, and, and anywhere. So I'm going to dive into a little bit more detail. So let's just say you wanted to estimate evapotranspiration. Uh, and I mentioned earlier, it's in section 3.8 four that you would find that that section so we're kind of looking at here the this, this uh, diagram that we have we show the water budget component evapotranspiration it leads us we identify hey let's go to this component 3.4 and then as we go through the material in section 3.4 you can see it takes us to methods on the very right side of the screen, and you can see the arrow goes down to here's sources of data. And these are the sources of data that you would find in the uh, uh, data resource direct directory. So kind of going to the directory itself now, what we have embedded in that directory is this kind of this crosswalk table. And so what you see across the top is we have water budget components listed across the top. And down the left side, you see all of the different data resources. And where you see the dots, that's where for each component and each data source, you could use that data source to for, as input data for that, that component. So I've highlighted in, in red evapotranspiration, and then in, you can see the blue, the the, the horizontal blue boxes that highlight three different uh, data sources that I can use to calculate evapotranspiration, uh, 9.2, 9.9, and 9.17. So I'm going to take a look at, look at those. Those would be my potential uses. There are other data that could be used, but I'm going to focus on those, those three. And so we go over to this slide and look at, okay, here's those three different sections. Um, and each one ends up, when you go to it, you get a data page. And just the general content of da each data page, you know, we look at trying to provide the user a brief description of what it is, the data link. Um, if there's also metadata, we try to provide that too, uh, a link to that. We look at you know, describing the temporal and spatial resolution of that data. And then we try to, if we can, provide some tips on how to access that data because we've accessed some of that data we try to share some of our lessons learned in this in this document to help the user gain get the most out of this this information so that that kind of summarizes sections three to to nine hopefully you find that there's a lot of useful great information that can really get you started on developing water budgets or you could go and look at you can go look at components and data resources that go with that and help you be able to fill, complete a water budget, water, a water budget account, uh, accounting template. I'm going to hand this now back to uh, Abdul. Thank you, Todd. <clears throat> the next section is actually uh, uh, came about because uh, prior to this public webinar, we did an internal DWR webinar, and uh, 
there were several questions. So these series of slides will actually show and illustrate how can the handbook help to address specific issues related to water budget development. And you'll see that we actually cover uh, sections one through nine uh, when uh, we respond to these individual queries. So the first one is, uh, if we want to avoid double counting when creating a water budget, where do we go in the handbook? So the answer is section one contains, as you have seen, a standardized accounting template and a common uh, vocabulary. So we think that these two together, when used properly, will ensure that uh, there is no double counting when water budget is developed. So the next question is, uh, if I want to decide whether or not to develop a model to estimate a water budget, the answer is uh, section two contents. Uh, actually, I showed you that flowchart, uh, discussion and flowchart to help identify uh, when to use a modeling approach or when not to use a modeling approach and when uh, to use a hybrid approach. The next question was, if I want to document the water budget work that I have done, but don't know what information I should record. Again, I showed some, some of those before, but just to reiterate, uh, section uh, 2.12 provides detailed guidance on how we can document uh, water budget. The next query is, if I want to estimate water budget components, and actually Todd has gone through you know, section three, four, and five, uh, which provide multiple methods, sources of information, steps to compute an individual component, and also example calculations for estimating the various water budget components. Uh, the next question is, if I want to find examples of applying the water budget standard accounting template in a real physical setting, Again, we have already gone over it. That's section six example. And uh, Todd has discussed it. That's where you want to go if you want to replicate for a uh, region uh, the complete uh, beginning to end in terms of land, surface water, groundwater, and the total water budget. Then the next question is if I want to use one of the two most commonly used, excuse me, integrated flow models in California to develop a water budget. Uh, that's again, section seven provides detailed instruction in terms of how to use IWFM or integrated water flow model to compile a water budget. And section eight provides detailed instructions uh, in how to use uh, mod flow ohm uh, outputs and inputs to develop a water budget. And then finally, I think this is the last thing, a uh, question, if I want to develop a water budget using the non-modeling approach, but cannot find an appropriate data source for the method. Again, section nine, as you have seen, it has a detailed list of resources, and it also has a cross-reference table to help easily identify sources of data for individual water budget components. So the handbook is actually available, and you may have already seen that on DWR's groundwater management data and tools page uh, under reports. And then uh, in the same website, we also have two more things. One is uh, a set of frequently asked questions and responses. And then uh, to facilitate understanding of the whole concept of water budget, we developed a water budget story map. We call it a story of innovation. You can also access that before you do a deep dive into the detailed water budget handbook. And some of the templates uh, we have used in section one, in section six, six, six and seven and eight, those are actually available in uh, CNRA open water data platform. 
and uh, there will be additional opportunities uh, to learn more about the handbook and how we can apply the handbook. We are actually uh, will be scheduling an extended public webinar on April 21st, uh, and uh, we'll be providing uh, more information how you can access that webinar. And the purpose of that webinar would be sort of like a almost a hands-on exercise uh, for sort of using the water budget handbook in a very practical way. And our original plan was uh, hosting a public workshop, but because of the uh, coronavirus situation, at least for the time being, we have decided in the interim, we are actually uh, going to do this extended public webinar uh, still uh, provide some uh, uh, information and opportunity to uh, our stakeholders to uh, develop a better understanding in terms of being able to use the Water Budget Handbook. And next, I'm going to hand over to Stephen Springhorn. Uh, he's going to discuss uh, considerations in light of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Stephen? Thank you. Thank you, Abdul. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, great. Yeah, again, my name is Stephen Springhorn, and I work within the DWR Sustainable Groundwater Management Office. And as Abdul mentioned, I'll be discussing some considerations of water budgets and the water budget handbook in the context of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, or SIGMA, the Groundwater Sustainability Plan Development and Implementation, so we all have a common understanding of, of these topics. So within DWR, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Office staff have been coordinating with the water budget staff, and we share the view that the process of developing and analyzing water budgets will improve the sustainable management of California's water resources. And it will also support decision making in the basins across the state and improve communication and coordination among water managers within basins and between basins. And so this is why, as part of our ongoing SIGMA planning and technical assistance to GSAs and related entities, we've worked with the Water Budget Group as they've developed the Water Budget Handbook. And like many other SIGMA data sets, tools, and guidance uh, DWR has provided, uh, they are offered as optional resources that GSAs and the public can utilize or not use. And if these tools or guidance materials are used, it does not guarantee the approval of a groundwater sustainability plan. So the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act uh, related water budget requirements are defined in the law, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act itself in the water code and the groundwater sustainability plan regulations that were uh, created to implement the law and passed back in the middle of 2016. And so for copies of the law or the water code requirements, the GSP regulations, and additional GSP water budget details, those are all available on DWR's uh, SIGMA webpage, in addition to uh, the information that uh, Abdul and Todd have uh, um, discussed today. So as a high-level summary of the water budget requirements in a GSP, it's to include a water a basin-wide water budget which accounts for groundwater and surface water entering and leaving the basin under historical current and projected water budget conditions. It's important to note that the GSP water budget requirements are not intended to be a direct measure of groundwater sustainability, but rather the intent is to quantify the water budget in sufficient detail so GSAs can understand their basins and use this information to inform and help future and help guide future projects and management actions in order to achieve the sustainability goal uh, for that particular basin. So to summarize, really the water budget is an important tool to inform uh, other parts of the groundwater sustainability plan and the implementation of that plan. So to maintain clear messaging to the Sigma community and on the nexus between the water budget handbook 
in the development, review, and implementation of groundwater sustainability plans. Um, our team and working with Abdul and his team have developed a series of frequently asked questions, and those are available on the Water Budget Handbook webpage that Abdul just uh, showed a few slides ago. And there's also additional resources or, or text related to this on the inside cover of the Water Budget Handbook in a section titled, Using This Handbook. And those two uh, resources provide uh, good information on the connections uh, of the handbook to the SIGMA process. And so the Sustainable Groundwater Management Office staff have and will continue engaging with the water budget team within DWR and also the GSAs and the public on water budget, uh, water budgets uh, by providing regional and statewide data sets. For an example, statewide land use data. Uh, we've been providing that over the last few years and continue to um, continue that effort uh, to make that water budget uh, related or relevant data available, as well as modeling tools like C2V SIM. Um, the model in the Central Valley, uh, which is going through a major enhancement and will be coming out soon. Um, and in an effort to continue developing and enhancing these models and modeling tools related to water budgets, uh, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Office is expanding our staff resources and expertise on technical support for modeling, water budgets, uh, surface water, groundwater interaction, and climate change, so we can continue engaging uh, with GSAs and related entities on these uh, important water budget related topics. So in closing, I'd, I'd like to encourage all of you listening to provide comments on the handbook so we can hear and incorporate your feedback um, and, and Abdul and his team can understand uh, the comments and, and work those in as appropriate. And if you have any uh, Sigma specific uh, questions, please visit the DWR Sigma webpage or e email sgmps at water.ca.gov. And for today's Q&A uh, for Sigma related questions, I'll be on the line as well as my uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Office colleagues, Tyler Hatch, uh, who leads the C2V SIM model enhancement and other water budget related activities uh, in the Sigma group as well as uh, Andres Guillen, who is also heavily involved um, in the water budget handbook process and also other water budget related activities. So with that, uh, I'll turn it back to uh, Abdul and thanks for your attention. Thank you, Stephen. So uh, Stephen was mentioning uh, the opportunity to provide feedback. Uh, at this time, uh, as you know, it was released, the handbook was released on February 7th. And we have a 60-day public comment period, which ends uh, in April, on April 7th. So we really uh, welcome your feedback, input, critique, so that uh, we can incorporate those feedback in the next version uh, of the Water Budget Handbook. Uh, with that, I'll uh, actually open up for Q&A, and we hope that uh, you have been able to hear us, and then you uh, will be uh, sort of responding to any questions that uh, have been uh, put forward to this uh, Q&A, Q &A, uh, you know, chat tool. Francisco, is are there questions? Yes. So we have a question. Uh, says, please define groundwater component of the water budget. Does that refer to reliance on wells, regulated basins under SIGMA, or existence of water in the underground aquifers of a specific watershed? So the way, uh, I'll actually, uh, it will be easier to define, uh, let me go back to the, so I, I'm just trying to go back to this, our 3D schematic. Okay, so uh, the approach we have taken, and this is based on a 
an extensive literature review available on water budget and looking at uh, surface water, groundwater, and land system, you know, in an isolated way. So the way we are conceptualizing the total water budget is it's a combination of three systems, uh, sort of getting input and then letting flow out to other systems and also interacting with each other. In this context, groundwater system, uh, as you can see that the brown part in this diagram, and it has a set of inflows. Uh, for example, it has a subsurface inflow, the blue, it, it, which is coming from an adjacent, the groundwater system of an adjacent water budget zone. Then uh, on the right-hand side, in orange arrows, we have groundwater export, uh, stored water export, subsurface uh, outflow. These are uh, sort of quantity of water, which is uh, sort of getting out of the groundwater system in the particular water budget zone under consideration. So these are basic inflow and outflow components for the groundwater system. But in addition to that, we have components which are inflow to the groundwater system or outflow from the groundwater system, but in the context of the total water budget, we are defining them as flow between systems. And I'll give you an example that in green arrows, from if we move from left to right, we have a conveyance seepage, which has, is an inflow to the groundwater system uh, from the surface water system. Then we have groundwater extraction, stored water extraction. These are outflow from the groundwater system to the land system. And then if we move on, we have recharge of applied water precipitation and then managed aquifer recharge. Those are uh, inflow to the groundwater system from the land, land system. Then we have two more arrows, which are actually sort of interaction of the groundwater system with a component of the uh, surface water system, the lake. We can have groundwater gain from the lake or groundwater loss to lake. And depending on whether it's a gain or a loss, it could be an inflow or an outflow from the groundwater system. And on the rightmost uh, side of the, uh, the schematic, similar to the uh, loss, gain or loss to the lake, we have groundwater gain or loss uh, to the stream system. Again, this can be either an inflow or an outflow, depending on the month or seasons of the year or a particular year. So this construct is looking at the whole from a systems point of view and from volumetric quantity. It's not necessarily uh, uh, looking at individual groundwater levels, but what does it mean in terms of the volume of water which is coming into the system and getting out of the system? Todd, do you want to add anything? Yeah, the only thing I would add to this and the way we way we set it up and the flexibility is we recognize that this the water budget zone could be any anywhere practically anywhere. You can have different combinations of aquifers, you might have a confined, unconfined, and you might be in a fractured a fractured bedrock. Those will be all the decisions of the 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 water budget practitioner on how to apply this and how you can actually calculate or maybe not calculate some of the water budget components depending on you know where your water budget zone is and in the characterization of your groundwater groundwater basin. So this idea is really just to give you a, a framework and a starting place for then the use user be able to go and look at well how how then can I apply 
are quiet. And uh, one thing I missed, I don't know whether uh, like folks joining on the webinar can see that, underneath this uh, schematic actually we have this change in groundwater storage. So that is also a very important component of the uh, groundwater system. I just want to note that uh, we made the presentation available through the GoToWebinar dashboard, so people can download it and see the entire presentation. Okay, very good. Next question. Um, so the next question is, does the handbook include discussion of uncertainty or relative quality of each alternative approach proposed for each water budget component? Uh, that's that's a wonderful question, and we are uh, we have been receiving this question from uh, many stakeholders and folks interested in water budget development. And uh, actually, uh, the handbook uh, on page 44, uh, section 2.11, uh, it includes a section called uncertainty in water budget estimates. And uh, our original goal uh, was to actually have a very comprehensive section and exactly respond to the question uh, asked that how can we quantify or estimate uncertainty in individual water budget components and then how that uncertainty then propagates to each of the system water budgets, and then to the total water budget. And uh, we sort of developed a 10, 20 pages uh, document. And uh, when we tried to uh, include that in the handbook, it, it appeared overwhelming, and then it was uh, sort of not flowing with the overall content of the handbook in a very uh, consistent manner. Because our goal of the handbook was giving a tool to people which they can use uh, to do the estimates for individual components and then bring them together in the uh, different systems and then the whole water budget concept. So at the end, uh, what we decided, we decided uh, to exclude that section from the handbook, but uh, we have a very strong feeling that in some future time, uh, we'll be undertaking, and then there is a, actually a need to develop a companion document, which we may call, you know, uncertainty premier for water budget components. Uh, primer for water budget components, and uh, I think that is a that is an important discussion, which should be included, in, in our view, uh, in the overall water budget development, you know, uh, sort of discussion. Todd, want to add anything? Nothing to add. Okay. So next question is. As GSAs began to work to implement GSPs, many hard decisions have been put off and now must be made. Who has to cut back and how, and how much and when? Groundwater budgets from our models are based on many elements that require assumptions. We will be collecting more specific and broader data sets. How will DWR help us incorporate this growing data into our model, increasing their acceptance and making them stronger. Uh, I'll defer the response to either Stephen or Tyler on this yeah, one. I can jump in. This is Tyler Hatch from the Sustainable Groundwater Management Office. So obviously right now we're in the middle of the GSP review process, and each one of those uh, GSPs that was submitted is going to be reviewed for adequacy according to the department's regulation. And so we will be uh, working with uh, those GSAs when we make those determinations to see. But overall, the, the process is an outcome-based process. So defining the sustainability goal, 
in accordance with the regulations to avoid undesirable results over the 20 year period and then implementing your, your GSP as planned, that is still uh, the way you have to move forward. Stephen, do you want to add anything? Yeah, thank you, Abdul and Tyler. The only thing I would add is that uh, there is some areas or requirements of the water budget uh, in the GSP to identify where data gaps are or uncertainty. Um, and so as Tyler mentioned, there is uh, a, the ability to have some of those data gaps and uncertainty because of just the nature of compiling the various data sets that go into the water budget. And so once we have an idea across uh, different areas of where those data gaps are or that uncertainty lies, the department has and will continue to be um, investing in regional or statewide data sets that can help the GSAs and local agencies or the public better understand their, their water budgets or the key data sets that go into informing water budgets. Like I mentioned earlier, the, the land use data or other types of data sets that we can provide as a state that multiple GSAs can use to, to always be increasing that understanding of the water budget through time. So there's the assistance role that I just mentioned, but then there's that sort of regulatory com, uh, component that Tyler mentioned. Thank you. So next question. Are groundwater exports for agricultural uses considered distinct and measured separately from groundwater exports for water bottling and beverage manufacturing? You have to take that? Yes, I can. Uh, this is Todd. This is this is the, the framework that we offer up here is a generalized framework that you can add is break things down as much as you you need to to represent what's really going on and how you want to represent water management in your area. If you if you really feel that to understand and share with stakeholders how things are being managed and you need to go, well, I want to break down groundwater exports, you know, for ag, for these different categories, you you are you are empowered here to go ahead and break that down. The template is flexible and you could add those. You can make the calculations or computations of those uh, individual items and then add them up because you would normally you're going to know or need to know that information anyway and it would probably be aggregated but you can keep them separate and represent them uh, as as such to convey you know the information you think everybody needs to know so uh, any any other thoughts okay <clears throat> Does the handbook include a discussion of water rights considerations, for example, surface water losses to groundwater in California law, has been caught up with one research concepts included in Sigma? At this time, uh, the water budget handbook does not, and I think I think our goal is uh, is not to include that discussion as part of the water budget handbook. Our goal has been always to uh, make this handbook a tool uh, to quantify individual components of the water budget handbook and facilitate estimation of individual water budget components based on the needs of individual uh, water agencies based on their uh, availability of resources, availability of data, availability of modeling tools and analytical tools. So if, in our view, water rights become an issue, that has to be sort of addressed in the context of how water rights play into the discussion and decision-making process uh, for an individual water agency. Uh, we felt that 
bringing the water rights discussion in the handbook, which is meant as a uh, technical assistance or a technical tool, will unduly uh, complicate uh, the message or the, the tool as has been envisioned by the department. You want to add anything, Tom? Yeah, I mean, typically when doing water budgets and the envision here was, as, as Abdullah said, the when we depict the, the water supplies that the, the person doing the water budget, that these, the supplies that are presented here are already constrained within the water 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 rights that whatever we're presenting or estimating a supply or using measured data, all that fits within that that those 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 parameters. Next. So when are we gonna get more details on the extender webinar? Uh, we hope that in the next couple of weeks we'll be able to provide uh, information on uh, the extended webinar, the specific time, and then uh, how you can register. We'll provide that to DWR events page and other, you know, the other uh, communication tools we use. So expect something within the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> Have either team considered types of monitoring that might be required to refine the data and the cost of such monitoring? Uh, I'll go first. Uh, in terms of the water budget handbook and its uh, its uh, intent, uh, this issue is not directly addressed except uh, when we talk about documentation, which is section 2.12, page 45, actually it goes to a series of information and uh, one of the items, uh, so there are actually nine items, item number eight and nine, actually 48, page 48, uh, we have included uh, uh, sort of this note uh, data gaps and monitoring needs, and uh, it reads like this. Based on the assessment of the water budget, identify data gaps and recommend future data collection and analysis efforts to improve water budgets. And item number nine, it's a, it's a uh, human resources. Document the resources used to develop water budget. Uh, developing a water budget requires a substantial commitment of funding and human resources. So these two items in the context for an agency to develop water budget, we felt that if they document these two items, over time there'll be a recognition at the agency level what they need to do in terms of improving monitoring and sort of filling uh, data gaps, and then also building capacity in their organization uh, for water budget development. But I'll defer to uh, Tyler and uh, Stephen if they have, want to add any anything else. Yeah, thank you, Abdul. This is Stephen. So on the monitoring network um, in the Sigma context, um, the, there's a specific portion of the regulations. Uh, it's section 354.34 which outlines the requirements of the monitoring network. And then within that section, uh, or the, within the monitoring network portion of the regulations, um, there's an assessment and improvement of monitoring network where there's some requirements about identifying data gaps within the basin and within the monitoring network of the GSP, which is a, a very important part of the GSP. Um, so that's where on the regu regulatory side in, in Sigma, the monitoring uh, comes in. And then the, on the assistance side of how to fill data gaps, um, the GSAs are required if they have data gaps to identify a plan of how to fill those data gaps over time. And the department on the assistance side is providing 
a number of avenues of assistance in the form of grant funds where uh, GSAs are applying for grant funds and using those grant funds to install new dedicated monitoring wells that get incorporated into their GSP monitoring network. And then there's also a form of technical assistance that the Sigma group within DWR is offering that's called technical support services where the state has drilling contractors available and is working with GSAs to um, identify or to fill those data gaps that have been identified um, at the local level. So if there's additional questions or uh, on those forms of assistance or how monitoring works into the GSP regulations or implementation, uh, we can follow up uh, with more information. So I'd, I'd encourage you to reach out on those topics. Thanks. Next question. Will BWR summarize and compile water budgets from regions throughout the state so we can see how regions compare to each other? And when might that summarize comprehensive view of water use throughout the state be available for public review? So I'll start uh, responding to that and then I'll also bring in uh, DWR's Division of Planning uh, Chief uh, Kamiya Givechi into the discussion because uh, as uh, you might know that as part of the water plan process, uh, DWR does uh, develop what we call uh, water supply and balance for uh, each of the planning areas. Uh, which are um, uh, then uh, these planning areas then are aggregated to the 10 hydrologic regions of the state of California, and then we roll it up further to the state of California level for the state as a whole. And as part of the water plan five year cycle, uh, we have been doing that uh, for quite some time. So, one of the things uh, we have uh, uh, sort of started doing as part of Water Plan Update 2020-13 is sort of transitioning from a purely a water supply and balance construct, which is sort of in the context of the water budget handbook is mostly focusing on the land system and the use uh, of the water as it applied to the managed environment. Uh, for update 2030, there is an intent to gradually transition to this systems approach of looking at the three systems together, the surface water, groundwater, and then land system. And we'll be conducting uh, a few pilots as part of that process and uh, sort of over time uh, want to be in a state where we can have for each of the planning areas, these are still very large areas, uh, have water budgets and then roll that water budget into uh, hydrologic region and the state of California as a whole. I'll defer to Kamiyar if he has additional. Yes, Kamiyar, I think you, you laid it out well, Abdul. The only thing I'll note is, uh, and Todd Hilaire knows this better than I because our region offices are the ones who do a lot of the heavy lifting in preparing the water balances for the California water plan. And as of now, we do have, as Abdul mentioned, data from water year 1998 through 2015. We have been updating those uh, as part of the five-year updates of the California water plan. And based on popular demand, we are moving to uh, be able to update those um, every year or every other year because people would like um, the additional more recent years available not to have to wait for every five-year update and we're setting up the, the data structure to do that. The other thing I'll note is while we report the uh, hydrologic regions, there are 10 of them that cover California and the planning areas and those are about 38 uh, we actually, the balances are calculated uh, at what's called an analysis unit, and there are 280 plus of those that cover California. So for those who are really interested, we can provide 
the water uses and the water supplies for those years that I mentioned at those analysis units. And we can also slice and dice it by county for those who are, are interested. And uh, I would uh, mention one more thing, uh, then I'll uh, defer to Todd and Tyler and uh, Stephen if they have, want to add anything. Uh, as part of governor's water resilience portfolio, one of the actions actually uh, recommends that uh, regional water budgets and statewide water budgets be developed as part of the uh, overall statewide planning process. That's right. And, and this come here again. And so <clears throat> back to a previous uh, comment or question about uncertainty and data gaps, the reality is we have not had very good groundwater data. And as a result, the water plan, water balance uh, methodology actually um, starts with water demand, both ag, urban, and water for the environment. And we do our best to find where the sources of supply, primarily surface water, were to meet those demands. And then we assume whatever is left over came from the ground. So groundwater, as it, it, it exists now, in the water balances for the water plan is the what we call the closure term. What we want and hope is that as uh, data as part of Sigma, the groundwater data becomes available in this transition that Abdul mentioned from the water balances of the land system to this total water budget, we will have better groundwater data that would be needed to actually quantify that. Todd, you want to add anything? Then I'll go to Stephen and Tyler. Yeah, I'll add that um, we are always looking for people to take a look at the data. You know, uh, please contact the water plan staff. We have been doing the water balances, a lot of water use data based on agriculture or land use mapping, uh, uh, compilations of agricultural acreage, breaking out crops kind of a little bit of the flavor you saw earlier in the presentation of how we've used, provided some of that information in the water budget handbook of how we roll, can roll data up if we have some different data sets to make the computations of, of agricultural water use, applied water, surface water, groundwater estimates. So I would encourage you if you're interested, take a, take a look. You can look at the higher level water portfolio data. You can request the detailed analysis, what they call the detailed analysis unit data and dive in for any particular region that you're interested. When we develop those data, our regional offices through the state spend a lot of time considering what goes into those. Look at you know the, the agricultural acreages. They look at the crops grown. They look at the the uh, uh, irrigation methods and the things that help to represent what is going on on the ground. And so they, was, they are a good source of information to compare with what maybe what el others are using in the area. So please uh, contact water plan staff. Uh, Stephen and Tyler, you guys yeah, want to this is, Yep, this is Stephen. Uh, so there's three areas that come to mind related to this question and, and really piggyback on what a lot has already been said. Uh, the first is the groundwater sustainability plans. As Kamiar already referred to, there's going to be a lot of new information coming from the groundwater sustainability plans and the requirements for annual reporting, the first annual report being April 1st of 2020, so just around the corner. And in those annual reports, there's a requirement for uh, the GSAs that have submitted their plans uh, and, and in this case, uh, the critically overdrafted basins, mostly, um, there's a requirement for them to submit annual aggregated data or extraction data for the preceding water year. So that information will be coming in um, and it will be available on our Sigma portal and also will be available to be incorporated into these uh, larger uh, more regional or statewide uh, looks at water use that have been mentioned. Um, so that is one uh, area that more information will be coming. And then as the groundwater sustainability plans in the 
other basins that are required to submit plans in the 2022 timeframe, those will also have to be submitting uh, annual reports. So most of the uh, high use basins or the basins that have uh, people and pumping going on uh, will be reporting uh, annual aggregated extraction data um, into the future. So then the second component is uh, Bulletin 118. And as uh, has already been mentioned of the California Water Plan, which is updated in the years uh, eight and three. Uh, Bulletin 118 is California's comprehensive uh, look at groundwater and it's updated in years ending in zero and five. And so the 2020 update of Bulletin 118, which is scheduled to be complete by the end of this calendar year, will have uh, regional summaries of water use, uh, very similar to what has already been described as the water plan methodology, uh, but just wanted to note that that will be uh, available in Bulletin 118 as well, and also tie into somewhat of the uh, groundwater context of that information. So then the third component, I'll turn it over to Tyler and discuss how uh, the state's C2V SIM or Central Valley model uh, plays into this question as well. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, the the uh, California Central Valley Groundwater Surface Water Simulation Model, uh, also called CQV SIM, is uh, another opportunity for looking at water budgets on a valley-wide basis uh, or a regional basis. And we're in the process and have been over the last few years of updating that model to help dial in some of the, the different numbers and work on making sure that the dynamics of the aquifer systems as we represent them makes sense. And uh, so the, that is going to be a, a valuable tool moving forward. Um, obviously still, there's going to be plenty of uncertainty that we're hoping to improve and reduce over time, uh, but it's going to be a very consistent and valuable tool for, for looking at, at water budgeting across the Central Valley. Thank you. Are funds available for low priority basins according to Sigma to conduct water projects for unregulated source water areas? Stephen, you want to take that? Yes, could you repeat the question, please? I didn't hear the first part of that. I just want to make sure I've heard the whole whole question. Thank you. Are funds available for low priority basins according to Sigma to conduct water budgets for unregulated source water area? So there are a number of existing uh, regulatory structures or frameworks for looking at all basins in the state. So uh, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act does apply to all 515 groundwater basins in the state. It's just uh, the requirement for the uh, in the high and medium priority basins, which is around 100 of those basins where the majority of people and pumping occur, uh, are required to do to form GSAs and develop groundwater sustainability plans. But in those low and very low basins, uh, GSAs can form be formed, as well as GSPs can be developed. Uh, there's another. Uh, opportunity in those low and very low basins for groundwater management plans, which were the precursor to groundwater sustainability plans. Those are still available to be developed in those low and very low basins, as well as the California statewide elevation, groundwater elevation monitoring uh, program or the CASGEM program, which is really focused on um, identifying, monitoring, entities that can understand where there's monitoring infrastructure and can uh, start to monitor groundwater elevations, which is a very important, as already discussed, data set that goes into uh, water budgeting or water management in these basins. So there, there are funds available through, other, through grant opportunities, and uh, that's something that we can 
provide more information on uh, and through our financial assistance branch within uh, Department of Water Resources has a lot of information and on their web page as well of current grants that are available or, or grants that are coming uh, for these types of efforts. All right, we are right on time. It's 1230. Again, uh, thank you everyone for attending the webinar and we'll have the PowerPoint presentation available. And then uh, in a couple more weeks, we'll have the audio of the webinar and the transcript of the webinar available as well, right? In a couple of weeks time. Thank you everyone. Uh, uh, and we look forward uh, to your you know, participation in the extended webinar as well on uh, scheduled for, tentatively scheduled for April 21st. Thank you. Bye.